Hey everybody, welcome back to Print and Play. And in my last video, we looked at this. This is the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's the latest board from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and for the first time, it's not designed to be a standalone all-in-one computer. Rather, this is a microcontroller board designed to compete with the likes of the Arduino. So this means it's got all sorts of general purpose input output, and it's designed to be used in projects and also be very low power consumption. In that video, we went over the specifications on the board, and then we ran some source code on it. But I thought it would be neat to take the board and write some code that pretty much anybody can get behind. A project that teaches you how to use buttons and LEDs and even a speaker, as well as one of the internal components on the board. And that's just what we're going to do today. So if you're ready, let's jump into the build and the project. Okay, so let's go over the parts for today's build. Obviously, we have the star of the show, the Raspberry Pi Pico. We also have a breadboard. We have a piezo speaker. We have a switch. We have two LEDs, a 2K resistor, but you can go higher or lower on the resistance depending on how bright you want your LEDs to be. And we have eight jumper cables. So let's start off by installing the Pico itself. So go ahead and push that into the Pi. Next, from the third pin on the top left, which is a ground pin, I'm going to connect my re resistor to both it and to the negative terminals across the top. So that now means all the pins in this spot are resisted ground through here. Next, let's go ahead and install our piezo speaker. And I install this with the positive terminal facing up, and I like to put it as far on the board as possible. So you can see there, the positive terminal is indicated by a plus sign on the top. Next, we'll install our LEDs, and we're going to install them with the long leg pointing down. I like to tuck these in as close to the pie as possible, making sure that the legs are on opposite sides of the divide down the middle. And finally, we will install our switch. I'm going to install the switch as far down to the bottom as possible so that it has very little to interfere with it, and we'll have plenty of space to be able to push it. Next, we can go ahead and start wiring things up with our jumper cables. So let's go ahead and wire from the resisted ground to the top pins on both of our LEDs. Next, we're going to go from one of the ground pins on the Pi. So we're going to count three from the bottom right. And we'll run one of those to one of the sets of pins on the switch. And we'll also go from that same pin, the third one in from the bottom right, to the negative terminal on the speaker. Starting next to that ground, we have GP13. GP13 will be wired to the positive terminal on the speaker. Next to that is GP12. It will go to one of the two LEDs. And you can decide which order you want them to be in. Next to that one is GP11. It'll go to the second LED. And finally, GP10 goes to the other set of pins on the switch. And with everything wired up, now all we have to do is execute some code on it. Now to do that, we're going to be using MicroPython, and to run MicroPython code on the board, if you haven't set it up previously, we need to install the MicroPython UF2 file for the Pico. So we'll start off by pressing and holding the boot select button, and with the button held, we're going to plug in our USB. If you've done it properly, the Pico is going to come up as a removable drive on your computer that you can then copy files to. The next step is to copy the Pico MicroPython file to the Pico. So it's basically just a drag and drop operation, and once the file copy is finished, the Pico will reboot in Python mode. With your Pico ready to go, we'll go ahead and get into the Thony IDE. Now if you don't have the Thony IDE installed, or if you don't have the Pico MicroPython UF2 file, I've included links to them in the description below, so you can go download them and you'll be all caught up. And if this is your first time in the Thony IDE, make sure that you click Tools, go to Options, and make sure that MicroPython for Raspberry Pi Pico is selected in the Interpreter dropdown. And the next step will be connecting to the actual Pico. So we'll click the Stop slash Restart Backend button, and we get a prompt down here, which means that the Pico is now listening and waiting for commands. 
So the first code we're going to execute doesn't actually use any of the new hardware that we've installed. Instead, it uses the built-in thermistor in the Pico hardware. So the Pico is able to measure its own temperature and, by extension, the ambient temperature of the room it's in. So if we take a look at the code I've written here, the first thing we're going to do is import ADC from machine. The ADC is the analog to digital converter, and that will allow us to read off the pin that the thermistor is connected to, in this case, pin 4. We're also going to want to be able to add a delay between reads, so from time we'll import sleep. We create a new variable called temp sensor, and it is pointed at ADC on pin 4. From there, we generate a conversion factor, which is 3.3, which is the voltage that pins run runs on, divided by 65535. This will convert the value that comes in into a proper voltage. Then we get into the main loop that runs the entire time the Pico is powered up after it's been executed. So the first thing we do is set the current voltage to the reading value times the conversion factor. Next, we do some math to convert that value into a temperature. This is a temperature variable resistor. So depending on what temperature the resistor is, it will provide more or less resistance. And since these values are constant, we can then take the value that's brought in and figure out what the relative temperature of the thermistor is. Now, these math values aren't for me. They're spread out all over the internet. I will provide links to the couple of videos that reference them down below. Uh, but these conversions are also used not only on the Pico, but also on some Arduino hardware and basically whenever you're trying to do these types of reads for temperatures. So with our conversion done, then the next thing we do is, uh, and I choose to print the value that was read in as well as the temperature, and then we wait for two seconds. So if we go ahead and execute this, we can see that the ambient temperature in the basement is somewhere between 19 and 20 degrees. Now, if I go ahead and put my finger over the chip and we wait just a little bit, the temperature begins to increase. So we've gone from 19 to 20 to 21. And that's about it. I'm pretty cold myself, so I wasn't expecting much of an increase. If I take my finger off of the chip and we wait a little bit, the temperature should start to come back down from 22 down to 21 and so on. So for the next example, I thought it would be neat to teach the Pico to flash some lights and play some music. So the first thing we need to do is import pulse with modulation or PWN and pin. So pulse with modulation allows us to basically change the frequency at which pulses are being sent out over the GPIO, which allows us to change the tone being played by this piezo speaker. Pin will allow us to be able to connect to not only the speaker, but also the LEDs. Also, we're going to need some delays in there, so once again, we'll import sleep from time. So the next section of code is developing a dictionary of musical notes. Now, a dictionary is basically what's known as a key value pair. You provide it a key and it returns a value. So this allows me to generate notes. So in this case, a low B or B0 is equal to 31. So 31 is what we'll actually want to play through the speaker to create a low B. And we can go all the way up to a D sharp number eight, which is 4978. Next, we need some songs. So I copied this Mario song from an Arduino example, which I'll link to in the description below. And essentially it's the notes that it needs to play. Uh, and then you'll also notice that there's zero. So a zero basically tells it to hold the note. So uh, one beat of E7, and then a second E7, which is held for two beats instead of one. If we look at the hot cross buns example that I've provided, you'll see that we have not only hold, but we also have silence. So this allows there to be a beat of no audio playing. Coming down to the actual code, while well, there's a play note subroutine, which takes a note and duration. So note, as you can probably guess, is the note that's being played and duration is how long to hold it for. So if a note is zero, do nothing. If a note is S, then turn off the speaker and do nothing. And then otherwise, we're going to turn off the speaker to create a break between the previous note and the current note, pause for 0 0.05 seconds, and then we're going to toggle the lights because I want the green and blue LEDs to flash back and forth as it plays music every time it changes the note. Then we turn the speaker on and we play the note and hold for the duration. So the actual code that plays the music starts down here. The subroutine ends when the tab value here returns right back to the left side of the screen. So when we define a subroutine, we then tab in, and then everything that is essentially to the right of here is part of the subroutine. So when we start the program, it turns the green LED on, the blue LED off, and then it says for every note, 
in our Mario collection, play the note, and then finally, after it's played through all those notes, turn off the music. So if we execute this, we get a pretty passable version of Super Mario Brothers. Now for hot cross buttons, we want to play it a little bit slower, so we'll change our duration from 0.02 to 0.04, and then we change the Mario here to hot crossed buttons, and execute. So essentially you can define as many songs up here as you want, and then just by changing this value you can have them play through. Now so far all of our examples have been non-interactive. You click the run button, it executes some code and it does something, but there's nothing to be done while you're doing it. And one of the things that makes these boards fun, both the Pico and other boards like it, is the fact that with all the GPIO you should be able to actually interact with it and build projects. So I thought it would be cool to build a Morse code interpreter. Now, the other thing is, since with the Thony IDE, while you're executing code and storing stuff in memory on the Pi, you can still interact with it, it means that you can use your Pi almost as an extension from your computer. So let's go ahead and add the Morse code creator that I've written to the Pico. We execute it and you can see it didn't do anything. It obviously did something down here, but it didn't actually cause the Pi to do anything. But now that we've got a prompt that we can type things into, if we do play message and type in hello world and execute it, we can actually play out hello world in Morse code. It plays it through the speaker and it flashes the LED on and off as well. So how does this work? Well, much like in the music example, we import pin and pulse with modulation as well as sleep. The first thing we do is create a dictionary of Morse code values. So on the left, we have the alphanumeric value. And on the right hand side, we have a string that indicates the way it's played out in dots and dashes. So an S indicates short or a dot and an L indicates long or a dash. So scrolling down, we see that we have our button defined. It's on pin 10, it's an input pin, and it's set to be pull up. This means that it's always set to high, except for when you touch it to ground. So whenever this pin goes to ground or goes low, we know that the button's been pressed. Next, we have our two LEDs defined as short LED and long LED. Those are defined on pin 11 and 12, and they're output pins. And I'll go into a little bit more of the explanation of why there's two LEDs shortly. Finally, we have our speaker, which is a pulse with modulation on pin 13. We have our, the speed of our dots and dashes defined here, 0.1 for fast and 0.2 for slow. And we have variables that allow us to turn sound and light off, as well as change the pitch and volume. So since we can interact with it, if we set our sound to false, and then we say play message hello, we get Morse code played through the LED, but no sound effect. If we then set sound back to true, but we set light to false and execute the same code again, we get sound, but no flashing lights. Of course, you could set sound and light to false, but then basically nothing would happen. We can also change the pitch. So if we set pitch instead of at 600, we set it to 1600 and we execute the same code. We get Morse code for hello played again, but at a much higher pitch. And volume, as you might guess, also affects the volume. So what's happening in the background? Well, we're executing play message. Play message accepts message as a string, and then it goes through every letter in that string, or for C in message, and it sends that letter as a lowercase character to blink letter. So what does blink letter do? Well, we can see if the letter is not equal to nothing, then it looks up the Morse code value for that letter and stores it in current letter. 
if letter is equal to a space, we pause for 0.6 milliseconds, but we don't turn on the light or beep the speaker. As it goes through, it prints out through console the letter, as well as the value it found for that letter in Morse code. Then it uses that Morse code definition and goes through each character, which is either short or long. And if it finds a long one, it sets blink speed to slow. If it finds a short one, it sets it to fast. And then if light is enabled, it turns the lights on and off. If speaker is enabled, it turns the speaker on and off. And then it pauses for the appropriate delay. And that's it. By turning the speaker on and off and turning the lights on and off and using that dictionary to look up values, we can put out pretty much any message in Morse code that we want. But what if we wanted this to change Morse code into text instead of text into Morse code? Well, then we can simply type in a record message, execute it, and it goes into recording mode. Then we can use the button to put in our dots and dashes. And on the screen, it actually converts it to text for us. So you can see I put in three short, then three long, then three short, and that converted to SOS. So how does that work? Well, we're going to take a look at the record message command. And you see the first thing it does is put out a message letting you know that you're in Morse code message mode. And if you wait five seconds, it will exit. Then we set a bunch of our variables. So we have a time counter, a delay counter. And then we also keep track of the current letter and the current word. And we always need to keep track of the previous status of the button so that we know if the button's just been pressed or just been released. Then we run a loop. So while true creates an endless loop unless you break the loop somewhere else. It'll just run forever and ever. So if the button's being pressed, we set our delay count to zero and we begin increasing the time count. Time count allows us to track whether or not you've pushed a short or a long. So if the time count is less than or equal to 15, we're still in a short press. So we light up the LED that indicates you're pressing a short note. We turn off the long LED. But if we get over 15, well, then that short LED gets turned off and the long LED gets turned high. So by having two LEDs, it allows you to train yourself on how long you can push the button before it goes between the two modes. Also, if the button has just been pressed, well, we need to turn on the speaker so that it's playing a tone. If the button's not being pressed, we need to turn the speaker off as well as both LEDs. And then we just take a look at the time count. And again, if it was less than or equal to 15, we're going to add a short to the current letter. And if it was greater than 15, we're going to add a long to the current letter. Then we're going to increase the delay count plus one. This allows us to track how long it's been since the last time the button was pressed. If delay count gets above 60 or 0.6 of a second, then we check to see if there's anything stored in current letter. Uh, if there is, then we're going to add that current letter to the current word. And we do that by doing a lookup. So we pass current letter in its Morse code value to the letter lookup, which basically goes through all the entries inside the dictionary and tries to find one that matches. If it does, it'll return a letter and we add that letter to the current word. Then the current letter gets set to nothing and we print what the current output is. If there's a delay of 300 or three seconds, we add a space to the current word. And if the delay gets to 500 or five seconds, then we exit recording mode. And it's just that simple. And these values can all be adjusted to your comfort level so that you can get used to it and you can increase them or decrease them depending on your proficiency. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at three pretty quick projects that I think anybody with a Pico can tackle. If you end up using the source code for any of these in one of your projects, let me know what you used it for. You guys are free to do with it whatever you like. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button so I know that you guys want to see more Pico content in the future. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe so that you're amongst the first to see my videos whenever they go live. If you have another video idea or another project you'd like to see me tackle in the future, let me know in the comments below. I would love to give it a shot. All right, well, that's it for today's video, but until the next one, stay creative.